Avatar The Last Airbender and also Legend of Korra was created by Brian Konietzko and Michael Dante DiMartino. And Jordan, I'm going to let you explain what's the relationship between Avatar The Last Airbender and Legend of Korra. Okay, so in the world of Avatar, there's this figure uh, named the Avatar, and they can manipulate all four elements, fire, water, earth, and air. And F and during their lifetime, uh, once they die, they are reincarnated into the next nation in their cycle in their world. So in Avatar Last Airbender, we follow Aang, who's an airbender. And after his lifetime, we follow Korra and her journey. And so that's what the series is based on. It's about Korra's life. And it takes place 70 years after the events of Avatar The Last Airbender. And by the way, you guys, we do have these other streams, people of color and character design, because obviously a big part of the character is the design. And so we will definitely dig into that for Korra. Now, here's how Crit Clash works. We assign a point of view to each of our staff artists. So in this case, Jordan is going to be arguing for Korra, the character, and Kat is going to be arguing against the character of Korra. Now, what Jordan and Kat express in this video about Korra, the character, it may not actually line up with what they think in real life. And that's why you guys should come hang out with us in the Discord after the stream so you can find out their real life opinions about the character. Kat, opening statement, arguing against the character of Korra. You got it. <laughs> so I see in Korra's character a phenomenon that I think is applicable to the series at large in that the creators have thrown us breadcrumbs and they're great breadcrumbs, but they're never truly the full loaf of bread that we really want. <laughs> we want to be nourished. We want it to be nutritious, but ultimately they always throw us breadcrumbs of representation. They throw us breadcrumbs of a story whose plot is more serious and adult in nature. And it's wonderful. We love to see that. I mean, Cora is a strong woman of color, the main lead in an action series. And that's amazing. I mean, I think this is the first time I've seen it in an animated show in America. But how do the creators progress her character beyond just that breadcrumb? How does her character develop and grow in a way that is believable and in a way that truly shows that Korra has become a bigger person? And I feel that this show has failed her character in multiple ways. All right, so my response to that, I actually think Korra is an incredibly strong character in the sense of how she was written. Now, are there issues with the show or whatever? Sure, you can nitpick all day. But if you look at her from episode one all the way through the end of the series, you will see an arc that in some ways uh, parallels Zuko from the previous series. She starts out as someone who's a bit bratty, a bit hot-headed. And even though she keeps some of those same traits, she matures to such an extent that uh, when you look back at the series, you can just it's it's almost hard to imagine or hard to believe like how much she's grown and all the experiences that she dealt with, all the traumas, all the battles, all the self uh, improvement is really something that uh, that is almost unprecedented. And I think that for that reason, she's probably one of the most powerful characters in the show, not just because she's a main character or the lead, but because of her growth as a person. I want to bring up Neil's comment. To be fair, the creators did their best considering the amount of setback it got from Nickelodeon. Jordan, can you explain that? Because I think a lot of people are not aware of how Legend of Korra came about. So how did that yeah. work out? Yeah, so as for, based on what I know, the the show was greenlit before it was even pitched. So Nickelodeon came to the creators, Brian and Michael, and they said, hey, we want another Avatar series. You can do whatever you want. It could be a continuation of Aang's story or it could be another Avatar. We just want more of this universe. And they said, uh, okay, sure, why not? And Nickelodeon only greenlit the first season, uh, which was 12 episodes. But as production went on as it, and as they were ending up the first season, Nickelodeon came back to them and they said, hey, we want to actually make like 40 more episodes. So then that put them into a corner. So they were forced to make all these extra episodes. And then later on, they moved their timing or the time 
slot of the show and they moved it to all online and then they cut the budget for almost an entire episode at one point and it just went through a lot of ridiculous stuff and you know now i can watch it and you know almost forget about all that history but there was some really serious stuff going on during the time the show was being made so it sounds to me from what you're saying that it was sort of a flawed production to get started with because i would imagine if you're a series creator, you want to look at the arc of the story and the best TV shows to me are the ones that bring things back. And that's what really enriches those characters. And so that is a, a pretty compromised situation to be working in. Kat, how about the design of Korra as a character? I mean, we talk a lot about character design here at Art Prof. We've done streams. There's a character design critique channel in the Art Prof Discord. And so, Kat, what do you think is problematic about Cora's character design? I actually really like the character design. I think the creators did a very good job in terms of incorporating that Inuit culture um, reference and uh, inspiration and putting that into this modern fighter that Cora is. And also she's a woman of color. I mean, how often get you, do you get to see a brown skinned lady just be the main lead in a series that is action? And I think that's amazing. Now, in accordance to appearance, although I do think the appearance is really good, there are a lot of issues behind the appearance that really makes the character fall apart for me. And I think First thing I think of is really the brutalization of Cora's body throughout the series, because we see her get blood bent into submissive positions. We see her getting suffocated, encased in a tiny metal box. We even see her get shackled, like literally shackled, crucified and forcibly poisoned. And at what point is it excessive? For me, it was truly that duration of time when she was being tortured and if for while well, being poisoned and crucified. And Cora is a woman and I've seen women's bodies be brutalized in all kinds of media. Unfortunately, it is something that we see often, but another layer to Cora's character and her appearance is that she is most definitely an indigenous woman. And the fact that they had a brown skinned lady be shackled and tortured is such a strange point in the series. I'm wondering what did the creators want to show us through that? How does this develop Cora's character in any way or form? In fact, I really think it was a detriment to them that they not only had this appearance of an indigenous woman, they had her tortured on screen. And I don't think that anyone can explain away this phenomenon. Well, here's the thing about that. I think that what you're saying is more about complaints about the story itself and maybe the arc of you know the, the the writing didn't appease you or the audience that they're going for and that's one thing as a design i guess i'll just address the design first i think the design is very strong and i think it's a good step uh towards the future of what this world represents in the original series we see that these characters are primarily solely in the uh, their nation. So you have the Wild Tribe, they pretty much don't go outside of that. You might have the Swamp Benders or whatever, but that's a very small, there's only like three of those characters. The Earth Nation primarily just had um, people in the Earth Kingdom around them the whole time. And so as you progress through the series and as you see this, there's a bit of a merging. So if you look at some of the characters like Mako and Bolin, they look like a myriad of designs between the Earth and Fire Nations. And Korra is someone like that as well. And she kind of blends in with them a little bit more, which is what I would expect from a world that's being merged culturally. And they're not as divided as they once were, especially in a place like Republic City, which is uh, like a, like a, what's the word I'm looking for? It's, just, it's a big mega city in, in this nation. Uh, um, now, going to the torture aspect, we saw torture from in the, in every almost every character in the show. We have Tenzin, who is Aang and Katara's son, who is light skinned, if you will, and he got tortured as well. There's a scene in season three where I legitimately thought he was going to die, and that was brutal. Uh, we see Aang, uh, we see him die, and at the end of season two, and then Guitar brings him back to life. And we see Guitar get, get beaten and blood bent. So I don't think that Korra being tortured is a good argument because we see there, no one is 
is uh, is taken out of the picture. Like everyone has been tortured at some point or another. And I think that's just part of the show that they're creating and the world that they built. Nathan is saying, but Cora really doesn't grow all that much. She is consistently whiny and her slight changes seem forced, at least compared to Aang. Well, what's your reaction to that, Kat? I think that her growth is very fragmented and it does give the illusion that she doesn't grow linearly. I think she, again, this is problems with production, problems with whether the next season would be green, greenlit or whatever. But I think the biggest we see is in her is truly in the fourth season reserved in that space. But yeah, I agree with Nathan, Nathan in terms of seasons one, two and three being very fragmented growth. Like I'm not actually quite sure if she really grew at all. Because another thing that is noteworthy in all three of these seasons is how they end and how the problems are resolved. And what we see consistently is that problems are never resolved. And all the antagonists also die at the end as if that was the resolution to problems. Like season one, Amon, done, killed. Season two, to <laughs> Unalak, uh, killed as well. And actually Korra personally executes Unalak. Um, season three, four of the antagonists, out of the four, three of them are killed. And they can, that just kind of like sizzles down the problem. It doesn't really address it. And we don't see how Cora learns from this either. So you, so I noticed that you kind of cut off season four as its own special thing. And that that's a little unfair because you have to consider the entire series and the growth. Um, so let's go each of the villains, right? We have um, uh, Aman who has the ability to take someone's bending away. Now, uh, something I didn't mention before is that Korra as a character was specifically built to be the opposite of Aang. So where Aang was uh, very lighthearted and childish, Korra was abrasive and rough. And, and the other thing that's a big difference is Aang never wanted to be the avatar, whereas Korra did. She always relished in it. And so when we see her, she's like, yeah, I want to be the avatar. I'm going to beat people up. And that's what the avatar does. And Amon, his ability is one that is in direct contrast to Korra because he has the ability to take her, basically her identity away if he gets his hands on her. And so when her bending is finally taken away at the end for a split second, she, you know, her identity pretty much is basically gone according to her because that's all she's built herself on. Uh, when she, And then in season two, she split from the avatar spirit, which is Rava. And so when that happens, she's like, okay, or, or before that, she's like, okay, at least have connection to the past avatars. And then when she split from Rava and that connection to all the other avatars are is lost, now she's even deeper where she's like, man, now I'm really by myself. I don't even have my past lives to go to. And that continues on throughout the rest of the series. And um, even Zaheer goes, we don't need the avatar anymore and does all the torture stuff that you mentioned. And season four, we see that conclusion of it. So I think it's a very strong character arc. Blighted Angel is saying, I'm glad that Cora has musculature appropriate to her physical capabilities. Often women are portrayed as soft and sensual, even though they are not written that way. Well, let's talk about that because people come in all different sizes and shapes. I don't know anything about Legend of Cora, but she is somebody who has been drawn a certain way in terms of body type. So Kat, what's your commentary about her physique? Absolutely agree. I love her physique. I love, again, this breadcrumb that the creator has thrown us. <laughs> and the breadcrumb here is that Cora is a strong woman and she has the physical capabilities to show that. But ultimately what makes a character design is not just their appearance. It is their function in the story and it is their function in the world around them. I'm sorry that Harry Potter is kind of a touchy subject right now, but I'm going to bring up Harry Potter as an example. <laughs> so what is Harry Potter? Harry Potter is this little British boy with a lightning bolt scar on his head. Without his past, without his present and future, that's all he is, a white boy with a scar on his face, right? But what makes Cora Cora is her story. And kind of interestingly enough, Jordan has already brought up my next point in that Cora is in a vacuum of space. And she is forced to learn about things all by herself. All of the characters around her are extremely one-dimensional. Mako, Bolin, Asami, they don't really have much of a developed backstory or really anything to provide the Avatar. Actually, it's proven in season two. She breaks up with Mako because Mako can literally be no help whatsoever. He's literally just there to be a sexy policeman. <laughs> 
<laughs> and like, not only are the characters around her one dimensional, but I just feel like the setting is also one dimensional as well. We have to talk about Republic City because it is such a huge setting point in the Avatar series. And, you know, it's got its own president. Um, it's a world power. And it is something that other nations go to when they want diplomatic reasonings or extra military force. Now, doesn't that sound familiar in our modern day world? Does that not sound like America? <laughs> and I'm just so confused. Like, what does, what does America have to do in a story that is so centrally Asian, Asian culturally? And I just feel like when Korra is in allegiance with Republic City, like every time there is a major problem in the Avatar world, she will go to Republic City. Anytime there is a major event in the Avatar world, like the coronation of the new um, Earth King, it happens in Republic City. And what does that just say about, it? that just doesn't make sense in the Avatar universe that Korra, this indigenous woman, is in allegiance with a Western imperialistic power. So, you're, I think there's one big part that you left out, and it's that she's learning and training with Tenzin, who happens to live there. And that's, I think, a big part of the story. Like in the first season, she goes to Air Temple Island, where Aang Katara's son Tenzin lives with his family. And, and matter of fact, she stows away. She doesn't even, um, she's not even like taken to Republic City. She just leaves and is like, I'm going to learn it. And I also think that's part of a production thing as well, because I, I've heard um, interviews where the creators were saying, you know, making Avatar, the original series was incredibly difficult because we had so many backgrounds. Every episode, they're in a new location. And that just weighs a lot on your art team, especially. And I think that was more of a way to slightly cut costs because you can reuse some of those same backgrounds. But even then, there's a lot of new areas we go to, especially when you get to season two. We spend a lot of time in the water tribes, we spend in season three, we go all over the Earth Kingdom, including Ba Sing Se. And then in book four, you spend a lot of time in the Earth Kingdom as well, in Zalfu, and there's flashbacks all these places. But the fact that she's staying in Republic City, I don't think that's a big issue. Here's the thing. Yes, it's inspired by um, a lot of Asian cultures, but it's not specifically China. It's not specifically Japan or any other Asian country. So and it's an American show. They're allowed to throw some of those things in there because whether we like it or not, the creators are American. So it would make sense. Speaking of which, Blue Wolf Spirit is asking, is this woman being drawn and written about by a man? Kat, how about some commentary about that? Because I'm assuming that Brian Konietzko and Michael DiMartino, they're the creators of the show. So I'm going to guess that they had some hand in designing Cora's story. What do you think about that? I mean, yeah, these are two white men who have created this show about Asian cultures, plural cultures. And yeah, they are the main force behind designing Cora as well. And there's really no way to hide it. I mean, they're there, they, they're white. <laughs> and I don't think it's a mistake that uh, Last Airbender and Legend of Cora got greenlit. Um, because two white men were running the show. I mean, but I will say that I enjoyed Last Airbender incredibly, incredibly. And Legend of Korra also has his great points too. I mean, how often do you get to see a character of color lead a show? Not often. So thank you, Brian and Michael for that breakdown. Thank you. <laughs> but again, I just want to address what Jordan was saying about learning and uh, living in Republic City and Air Temple. In the end, everything of importance that happens in the Korra universe happens in Republic City. And the fact that Korra, an indigenous woman, is being sort of like the poster child of a city-state that is very much influenced by Western imperialism simply does not make sense in the series, nor does it make sense in her character. Yeah, I, I personally don't, I still don't really see much of an issue with it. And I, I th it's just her home at this point. And she goes and travels the world just like Aang did, just on a, on a smaller scale. And there's plenty of other environments that she went to. Uh, and, and to go back to that previous comment about was uh, was Korra drawn by a uh, man or woman, uh, or written by a man or woman, the characters were written by several writers. So you would have to go into each episode and figure that out. 
But these are the same creators who created great characters like Katara and Azula and Toph and May and Tylee, like all these great female characters. And I don't think that um, just them having to, I don't think that's, if if someone doesn't like Korra, I don't think it has to do so much with the the fact that the, these men wrote it. I think it's just because they see something that in the character that is flawed. And that's totally acceptable to have that opinion. Blighted Angel is saying, I'm also happy with her hairstyle, appropriate to her culture, but not as fussy as Katara's was. All right, well, we were talking earlier about the actual physical appearance of Korra, but what about specifically the hairstyle? Because one thing I've definitely noticed is that hair is such a statement of identity in a lot of cases. And I think a lot of people sometimes are so into the face when they're working on a character design, and yet the hair can speak volumes about who somebody is as a character. So what about the hair, Kat? I do like how the hair started as well. I know Katara had these hair loopies <laughs> that were very reminiscent of Inuit culture hairstyles. And I do like that Korra's hairstyle is, maybe it is a very direct reference to an Inuit hairstyle, I'm not sure. But to me, it seems like sort of a merge of Inuit hairstyle and modern day culture. Um, which is basically the time space that Korra lives in. So I think it works out very well. But I do want to point out that in season four, she cuts her hair. She cuts her hair in a way that you kind of lose all of the Inuit identity um, hairstyle influence. And now I know that cutting a hair, that your hair is supposed to be symbolic. I mean, last Airbender had a scene where Zuko cuts his hair off. It's symbolic and it does have very heavy cultural meaning. But in Korra's case, she kind of cuts it into a really chic Western Bob style. Like <laughs> if she's truly going to cut her hair off for cultural significance, if she truly wanted to make a step towards bettering herself, why did she give herself such a fashionable hairstyle? I mean, like normally it would be way shorter, right? Like, it makes sense culturally. <laughs> okay, so about the hair. Um, I I remember watching that episode and the episode that Cass talked about is Cora Alone's in book four. And literally she cuts her hair by herself at a river. She just pulls her hair back and gets a knife and goes shink. And it just turns into that. I don't know if she was so much consumed with the cosmetic of how it looked um, or, or anything like that. The other thing is when you think about what she was doing that for, yes, it represented like a kind of a rebirth, but she was also trying to hide her identity because before that she was in recovery mode. She was uh, a broken avatar, if you will. And people were recognizing her as the avatar and they're like, hey, go save, go save us or, you know, whatever. And she became embarrassed almost. And she's like, okay, I'm gonna hide my identity. And in this scene that we're seeing right here is when she went to the earth kingdom, got her butt kicked by an earthbender and she's just, and no one is able to recognize her as the avatar. They're like, don't, do you remember that avatar character? No, I don't know. I don't know who you're, I don't know what you're talking about. And she just leaves. So. I think even as a story point, it works. Alyssa is saying, I heard the Cora team cut her hair because of budget cuts and long hair is more difficult to animate. Do either of you know if that technically is true? Kat, do you know about long hair in animation? Does it matter? Um, I do not know really. Uh, Jordan, do you know if this was the case? I've never heard of that before. Um, and, and even if, I don't, even if that was the case, I don't understand why that would be the specific thing they would cut from the budget. Um, you know, it's just a couple of extra strokes with a pencil, but yeah, I've never heard that before. Yeah, but it is interesting that this idea of a character cutting their hair, if, if you think about all these different movies, that moment when somebody cuts their hair, it's like such a big deal in terms of the shift of the story. So I think that's a, a really important change in the character design because isn't this cat the post haircutting style is this it yeah it is <laughs> yeah like to me this does look a little stylish it's i don't know it's sort of that choppy hairdo that you expect to see i think more in today's time period so one other thing i want to bring up is the color scheme of cora because first of all she's a woman of color but also I think what sort of surprised me about her character is that her character's colors are pretty muted. Like actually it's this hazy blue, these 
toned down browns and stuff. What do you think about that, Kat? Yeah, I agree. I mean, she is a water tribe girl. And so she's going to dress in blue water tribe traditional gear. It simply does make sense. And I actually do like the blueness of her. It really makes her stand out, especially when you see her in a group with Asami, Kor uh, Mako, Bolin, and Tenzin, which is an image we saw earlier. She truly stands out. She is a star. She is the main lead. And I think it actually works with the color schemes you see here. But Again, sorry, I'm going to be a Debbie Downer. <laughs> I'm going to mention something else. <laughs> I think this physical difference really highlights how alone she is. As I said before, she kind of goes through this series in a vacuum of space. None of the other characters are really developed enough. And additionally, as the Avatar, she loses the Avatar lineage. She loses hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of history. And see, in Last Airbender, that was important when Aang lost his air culture. And that is something that is constantly brought up throughout the whole series. And it's something that, it, it births something new, yes, but there is something left to, to mourn. And I think that's important when you're trying to learn and continue on. Now, in Korra's case, she lost the Avatar lineage. She lost half of what it means to be the Avatar, is to be the balance between spirits and humans. She lost the humanity of the Avatar. And she's truly alone in this case. And she also is not really given any time or space to mourn this loss. She kind of loses it in second season and is kind of treated like she lost her personal Wikipedia page. Like, oh, I guess you cannot <laughs> ask any questions to the Avatars guess that's it. <laughs> and so anyways, going back to this color scheme, I just think, yes, it makes her stand out, but it truly makes her other in the cast of characters. Okay, so that's, all right, I'm gonna try to remember all these points you made uh, with Cora being uh, alone in her design. I actually think that that works out very well, considering that, you know, when you have the ensemble cast of the last, Avatar Last Airbender, we see Aang is the only one with the blue arrow on his head. Like he's the only guy. Uh, and Korra, it's a little bit different because she's not the last waterbender or the last person from the Southern Water Tribe or anything like that. She just needs to be around these characters. And I, you know, you made good points about her being the only one in blue. Uh, she has the darkest skin tone of everybody. She has a unique hairstyle. All those things I think work really, really well. And it, in emphasizing her be, feeling alone, I think that's part of her journey is recognizing uh, or, or understanding how to deal with a lot of these things because for the most part she kind of is alone like the in the the whole lost avatar thing i gotta be honest that crushed me when i saw that in in the series like why would you do that because you know but the other part of it is i think that i, I think that it uh part of it isn't as impactful because we don't see her use it that much um, we see Aang for a split second at the end of season one, and we see the two uh, Avatar 1 episodes, which are great. And then we see like maybe one or two other times where she uses it. So it's not like it's a huge loss to her. It's not like she was talking to Aang like every single day and, you know, lost his phone number type of thing. It was just so I and I think that with her arc of her continually continuously feeling more alone, like with uh, season three, one of the things that I thought was really important at the end is to hear the villains, they believe that the Avatar shouldn't even exist. And that's where we go into the poisoning and, you know, ending the Avatar cycle as we know it. And when that happens, the aftermath of that is, you know, she gets in this big fight and she gets so injured that she can't even walk. And every other character is like, don't worry, Cora, you just get better and we'll take care of things from here. And if you and you take if you're in that situation where you just got your butt kicked by all these guys trying to kill you, you're the 17 year old girl just trying to live your life, <laughs> and that happens, and then you hear that from your closest friends. Of course, that's going to destroy you, make you feel alone. And that's why I think the arc in season four is so much stronger than I think people really give it credit for. Samuel is saying, I'm really glad the creators decided to make the Avatar a female character. It really gives us a full perspective of a young woman handling difficult challenges throughout her journey. What's your take on that, Kat? Samuel, I absolutely agree with you. When I first saw Korra, or at least when I saw the teasers for Korra, I was thrilled. I mean, here was a main lead who was a woman who looks physically strong, who is indigenous lady, heading a series about action. And I think that's incredible. But I think that if we only stay there, 
um, if we only give the credit for getting these breadcrumbs, it's sort of like it's sort of like winning a bronze medal. Like when you win a bronze medal, you're happy you placed in the first place. <laughs> but I disagree because I think Cora, I think Legend of Cora is a silver medalist because yeah, we see some amazing changes. We see a main female lead who is a woman of color. We see stories that really tackle PTSD and how to recover from something so horrible as that. And yes, that's amazing. But it lacks just that extra leap to make it to gold. And so whenever I watch Legend of Korra, the only thing I can feel is potential, which is almost maybe even a more painful feeling than nothing at all, because you've given me a little bit. Now I want to see the whole progression. I want to see the whole development. So with that, I think that, it, I, I think Korra, I think part of that is comparing it to the previous series. The thing with the Avatar, the original series, it was planned from the jump to be three seasons and that's it. And Aang's journey, Zuko's journey, everybody had a complete final story. With Korra, they kind of pushed as they went. And I understand how difficult that would be. The other thing is I think Korra still pushed a lot of boundaries because if anyone has seen the last couple minutes of the last episode, she uh, Korra represents the first character who is in an openly uh, gay relationship in an animated series, which was huge. And a lot of people um, fell off, you know, a lot of people hated the ending, a lot of people loved the ending, but it was one of those things that created a spark in the conversation. And now you see that happening more regularly in animated shows, but to be honest, Korra was the first one to really uh, bring that to the table. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree with you. But again, I'm going to say that it is a breadcrumb that is thrown at us. Like, honestly, there is no chemistry between Korra and Asami. I didn't even know they were friends. <laughs> they didn't even have that friendship, let alone a rel romantic relationship. And they honestly, did, yeah. the handholding at the very end felt like something the creators just like threw over their shoulders as they were exiting the studio. It was a step. It was a step. It was a crumb, but it definitely was not nutritious. <laughs> <laughs> Blighted Angel is saying, I just noticed Cora is the only brown person in that group photo. Thanks for pointing out the othering cat. Well, Jordan, what do we say about that? Because we've talked a lot about people of color in that character design stream that you and Kat did a ways back. And it's certainly a topic that we've been exploring here at Art Prof. What about that choice to do that with the characters, Jordan? I mean, she might be the only brown person, but it's not like she's the only person of color in the series. Um, they mix and match all over the place. Matter of fact, if you take uh, Tenzin and, and his siblings, uh, Kaya and Bumi, they're all different shades. You know, Tenzin is more like Aang, uh, Kaya is more like Katara, and then Bumi is somewhere in the middle. <laughs> so I don't think that's a statement so much on, you know, the entire show as much as just the people she hangs out with or the group. So we got Aang, Aang's son takes after his father, Bako and Bolin, the two men on the right beside Korra are brothers. So that kind of makes sense. And then you just got Asami who's from the Fire Nation who, I don't think I've ever seen a, someone from the Fire Nation not be that skin tone. So I think that makes a lot of sense having her be, having her look this way. I actually, that um, reminds me of something that we haven't talked about just yet. And that is the people that Korra surrounds herself with. I mean, I've already said that they're all one dimensional characters, but that aside, I think it's kind of weird that in the beginning, Korra is really groomed to be the avatar. She lives in a bubble where all of her things, all of her environment is controlled. And she wants to break out of that. In fact, that's a huge part of her character growth and also her innate, I don't know, character trait. She wants to get out of that bubble. But in the process of getting out of this bubble, she jumps into another bubble in that the whole series we never talk to anyone who's a non-bender who's a normal civilian. The only people that Cor the only people that Cora the only people Cora talks to are government officials, ruling class, benders, and Asami and Varric, who are non-benders, but they're part of the ultra rich. They are part of the high class. Now I know it's not fair to compare it to The Last Avatar, um, The Last Airbender. But in The Last Airbender, we got to see freedom fighters. We got to see refugees. We got to see school children in a country that is surrounded with propaganda and how that affects their daily life. 
And even though Korra and Aang come from different storylines, even though they're different people with different goals, that doesn't mean that they can't have similar morals. So what we know about Aang, what makes Aang strong is team Aang. But what makes Korra as strong as it is, is Korra by herself, is Korra alone in a vacuum of space. And I think that is where these two series really differentiate. Beyond intended differentiation, it really is a loss since the first series. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I'll be honest, the, the side characters, Mako, Bolan, Asami, not super interested in them either. I think that they there's lots of elements of being one dimensional. Um, Tenzin, I think is a great character. Actually, I like all of Tenzin's family. They all always made me laugh and yeah, I, family, I always yeah. enjoyed them. Um, I, I But you have to think about uh, like Varric. I think Varric was a great character. It was not Bender. And, you know, as far as Korra not meeting all these non-Benders in different places, I mean, the thing is, we've kind of seen that before. And when you're creating a sequel show to something as highly acclaimed as Avatar, like I've literally met, met a single person who doesn't like that show who's actually seen it. And I think part of that was like, we don't want to repeat ourselves twice because Aang's journey, he's going all across the world trying to find a teacher to teach him whatever element he needs and comes across a group of people who are dealing with the threat of the Fire Nation impeding their, their growth as a society or whatever. And Korra, it's more about, you know, her learning to become the Avatar. She's already got the elements excluding air in the first season. Um, she's got that down. Now it's about character growth and how do I grow? How does she grow as a person? And so, you know, I, I really think those side quests, my, I don't know if those would have served as well. And we do still get a few of those in the series, maybe not as much as Aang, but yeah. Ray DeVore is saying the censoring of a WLW relationship really was a crumb, a step forward, but we need to keep pushing for better representation. We got a lot of comments here. I'm sorry I won't be able to get to all of them, but great commentary. Sarah is saying, as a queer woman, I can't tell you how much the season four finale meant to me. The creators have mentioned on multiple occasions how Nickelodeon barred them from exploring Korra and Asami's relationship. Yeah, there, there's a lot. Wow. Oh my goodness. I'm going to have to <laughs> do the best I can to get to all these comments. Lucinda Murphy is saying if Asami's character was male, there would have been the same amount of Korasami shippers, even without the scene at the end. Could have been developed more for sure. Well, there's some ammunition for you, Kat. What do you think? I mean, yeah, absolutely. I do want to give credit where credit is due. It's hard to get that kind of, rep it's hard to get LGBTQ representation onto the big screen. And Cora has done the step to that. But, and I think it has carved the way for future series. I mean, I'm not going to spoil anything, but there's an animated series called Shira. <laughs> there's some LGBTQ representation in there, but Cora has really paved the way for that, yes. But you know how easy it is to censor the bisexual relationship that happens in Korra, uh, in Korra's um, season finale, because all they do is really hold hands and walk off into the light and really no development to that relationship. We don't see depth to that relationship. We don't see content. We literally only see a handholding scene. And yes, that is the first step to take. But for instance, if Korra was streamed into a country where being gay is illegal, it's very easy to cut that out of the series and also have the series continue to make sense. And in Shira, <laughs> that relationship is integral to the series to the point where you cannot censor it possibly. It's important and it's good to show that these relationships have importance. So yes, Korra has given us a crumb. It's paved the way for other things to do better, <laughs> but Korra has still had a ways to go. I'm gonna respond to that by saying, <laughs> I, I've read the art book, I've listened to the interviews. The creators actually wanted to do more with that, but Nickelodeon wouldn't let them. Um, mm -hmm. They were actually almost didn't even let the show run because Cora was a female. Like mm -hmm. they, they were so concerned that young boys wouldn't watch it. And, you know, and the thinking of a big corporation like Nick or a big company like Nickelodeon, they're thinking, okay, action show, that's targeted for six to 13 year old boys. Would they watch a female action hero? And when they did the test, they're like, oh, heck yeah, we love Cora, she's awesome. Um, so with this, it, it was the same thing. They kind of, they were stopped in the middle of it. They said, look, you can't show like super um, 
you know, super uh, or anything that would suggest more than what they already presented. So they that's why they had to do the little blushing scene uh, mm -hmm. where they first meet after a while and the holding hands. And I remember um, before, you know, really analyzing it, uh, there's a lot of people who felt kind of ambiguous to that scene. They were like, oh, are they just holding hands as friends? Because even I was a little confused at that. I was like, <laughs> no, what, you know, I was like, are they just pals going through or are they in a relationship? And so understanding the creator's intent behind that and seeing what it led to, especially in the comics, and I we're not talking about that, but I think that that was, you know, given what they had, they did a really good job. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree with you. I think that Cora really has done what it could, <laughs> given the circumstances, given everything. But unfortunately, we can't go to every single viewer of Cora and be like, they had production problems, they were bored, <laughs> like to every single person watching the series, unfortunately. But yeah, no. I agree with you, Jordan. Julie Ben Bassett, who, by the way, <laughs> is going to be here on an art pro stream very soon to do one about manga. <laughs> Kat, we're super stoked for that stream. So you guys will see Julie at some point. Julie's saying, I think Cora is a story about her learning about the world in a more focused lens, but it was a shame they didn't explore how the world post war. And Jing Jing is saying most of the LGBTQ folks I'm friends would see a lot of subtle development between Cora and Asami, particularly with her letters to Asami and their interactions between each other in season plus four end. All right, guys, we could go on and on, but it's time for you to decide who won this crit clash. Was it Kat? with her breadcrumbs that apparently Blue Bull Spirit is going to think about cat and breadcrumbs from now on. <laughs> or was it Jordan who argued for Legend of Korra, the character? So tell us, who won this crit clash in the chat? Was it Jordan? Was it Kat? And while you guys are doing that, I'm gonna let you know that we have another crit clash that also had to do with character design very different context. <laughs> Billie Eilish, my future music video. Wow, not even remotely the levels of complexity in terms of story, but lots of similarities talking about setting and color schemes and character design. And also this is a really great stream that Kat and I did. Well, Kat did most of the heavy lifting <laughs> in this one. It's a character design stream about badass women in character design. So many cool characters in the stream who I'd never heard about before. So this is a great stream for you guys to take a look at. Let's see who is voting. Oh, well, Connor says Jordan. Sarah says Cat. Josh says Cat. Blighted Angel says Cat. It wasn't fair to put you in this position, <laughs> Jordan won. <laughs> Care to elaborate? <laughs> <laughs> Neil says, I'm sorry, Kat, your breadcrumbs just don't work for me. Gabriella says, Kat. Neil says, Jordan. Slapnir says they can't vote, but you can give us really good puns. You're always here for that, mm -hmm. for sure. And, oh, we have some strong opinions. Blue Wolf Spirit thinks that Kat totally crushed it. Jing Jing says, Jordan. My goodness, you guys, this is not easy. I don't know that I can count this far. Seven Angelic says, this is tough. I like Cora, but Kat was quite the debater. Sorry, Jordan. 10,000 Crows says, close, but Kat. Kat and the breadcrumbs. You just need a catchy metaphor, Jordan. You have <laughs> that was not what I was missing. Exactly. Julie says, talking about Cora always turns into a bloodbath, <laughs> but this was very civil. Both were good, but I have to say Kat. I don't know, Jordan, this is not looking good for you. Blighted Angel says, with Jordan's extensive knowledge, he should have been the dissenter. Um, I, <laughs> well, Jordan, I'm sorry to tell you, but I think Kat won this crit clash. Yeah, see, it's the breadcrumbs. It's the metaphor. Oh, Vin yeah. is saying the breadcrumbs did it for me, so Kat. All right, you guys, Art Prof has a podcast available on Spotify and also on iTunes. And if you guys want to know what Jordan and Kat really think about Cora, come hang out up with us in the Art Prof Discord. We will be in the channel called Crit Clash Reveals. 
And wow, we, we, we could have a bloodbath over there. Well, hopefully a civil bloodbath, maybe a metaphorical bloodbath. Maybe that would be better. <laughs> so subscribe to the Art Prof YouTube channel and join the Art Prof family. And thank you so much to our top Patreon supporters for helping us out, for keeping Art Prof up and running. Thank you to everybody. Such great commentary during the chat today. You guys really help us round out the discussion. It's so great to hear everybody's thoughts. Everybody, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.